Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chen Li. I'm director and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution's John L. Sountain China Center. It's my honor and a pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on engaging China, reconsidering the strategy and the practice. The main title of our event is pulled directly from the new book, Engaging China, 50 Years of Sino-American Relations, edited by Anne Thurston, professor at the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and published by Columbia University Press. This superb volume represents assessments of the major fronts of US-China engagement since President Nixon's epical visit to China in 1972. 14 prominent American experts on Sino-US relations, including all three of our distinguished speakers today, as well as my Brookings colleague, Ken Libersol, have contributed chapters to this volume. The publication of this book could not be better timed as US-China relations have drastically deteriorated in recent years. In present day Washington, the post Nixon era of engagement with China has often been regarded as naive at the best or a failure at the worst. The new strategic or political narrative such as decoupling and extreme competition have dominated the policy discourse regarding China. Although just today as part of her, her conversation at a public event elsewhere in Washington, trade representative Catherine Tsai used the term recoupling. Now, this most consequential bilateral relationship in the world is heading toward a confrontational state. Not only has each side accused the other of being a genocidal regime and has speculated the COVID-19 pandemic originated from a lab leak in the other country, but the risk for military conflict and the war is also on the rise. The stake for US policy toward China have never been higher. To be sure, many American scholars of Sino-US relations, including the author of the volume, neither see five decades of engagement with China as a complete failure, nor believe disengagement will now serve US interests. Many daunting challenges in today's world from climate change to nuclear non-proliferation, from global financial stability to global pandemics, all require joint efforts by the United States and China. Yet, we do not need to reconsider the strategy, and uh, we do need to reconsider and the strategy and practice of future engagement with China, simply because one, the global geopolitical uh, landscape has changed, two, China's ambitions and role in the, world, in the world have changed. Three, both countries' domestic and domestic social political environment have changed. And four, public uh, perceptions of each other have changed. That the list can go on. We are so fortunate to have three seasoned China experts, David Lampton, Susan Sangton, and Robert Daly, to share their insights into how today's policies toward China can be informed by the past half century of US-China engagement. They will discuss what the new strategic grounds and the practices we should pursue at this critical juncture. None of our three speakers need a, an introduction, but please allow me to say a few words about each of them. David Lampton, who as many of his, his friends call him, Michael Lampton is professor and the director of China Studies Emeritus at the SAIS, where he also served as a dean of faculty. For many scholars and students in China study in the United States, myself included, Professor Lampton has long been seen as our dean as well. His book, this book, actually is very appropriately dedicated to Professor Lampton for his lifetime of contributions to the China field. Mike, we are so honored to have you on this panel. Susan Sangton is, is a senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center at Yale and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings John L. Sangton China Center. By the way, 
she bears no relation to John Sumter. Susan was a diplomat with almost 30 years of experience with the State Department, where until July 2018, she served as an acting assistant secretary for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Over the past three years, Susan has frequently spoken in public forums in both the United States and China to promote mutual understanding. When asked on a TV show why she is willing to put herself in a difficult situation or position, Susan said, I quote, as a mother of three children, I want our future generation to live in peace. Susan, thank you for these powerful words and deeds and for speaking with our audience today. Last and certainly not the least is my dear friend, Robert Daly, the director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Bob served in the US Embassy in Beijing for many years, and he interpreted it for meetings of top leaders like President Jimmy Carter and President Jiang Zemin. He became a household name in China after he performed as a main character in Beijing natives in New York, the popular TV, Chinese TV series in the middle 1990s. Bob is also on great respect for his intellectual integrity and his outspokenness about human rights violations in China. Bob, welcome back to the Brookings stage. Each of them will offer seven minute opening remarks and then we will have a Q&A discussion. For audience questions, if you have not submitted uh, one yet, please email to events at brookings.edu. Over to you, Mike. Well, Chong Li, thank you very much for that generous and warm introduction uh, for myself and ob obviously my colleagues, but I'm most grateful they um, are participating in this program. Um, I, I want to thank you for your moderation and uh, the questions to come and uh, and you've put a lot of effort into this and I'm appreciative as we all are. Um, I do want to thank Ann Thurston, the editor of, of this volume for the superb job she did in editing in it and it wasn't just editing in a mechanical sense, it was the intellectual architecture and substance. And then the writing, I think she uh, excels in, and uh, I think it's uh, beautifully edited. Uh, and I do want to thank Columbia Press for the uh, production of it, uh, both expeditious and affordable. And I, I want to acknowledge this book's in, and we're all proud to have it in the Nancy Tucker, Warren Cohen, Cohen series of Columbia University Press. Lots of people to thank, but I'll forego that in the interest of, of time. I think one motivation of this book was a growing narrative, and Chung Li mentioned it, that engagement has been and was an, a naive strategy. Uh, it was naive, so it's alleged, by asserting that open markets, dialogue, and generous terms for ending the, entering the global system uh, would itself produce a kinder, kinder, gentler, more democratic China. Uh, that was uh, not where we found ourselves in 2013, and consequently, the uh, narrative has been that that set of motivations, that so-called strategy, uh, was misinformed, uh, misdirected, and in fact, harmful to U.S. interests. Uh, the purpose of this book and the conference in 2018 on which it is based was to examine that proposition. And not all of the chapters in this book fully agree with each other. There are important differences, but I think there are some important com commonalities. Uh, this book is an effort to describe how engagement came about, why it evolved as it did, assess where it is headed, and convey the lessons that uh, at least some of the lessons we think can be learned. There's a first draft of history being propagated at the current time. And uh, at least many of us, certainly myself, feel it's misleading and dangerous. So we, if nothing else, I hope this volume will contribute to a more balanced, uh, far-seeing 
kind of analysis of not only what's happened, but what our options for the future may be. Now, if you consider this book as a whole, I think it really makes, it makes a lot more points, but I would extract three for our discussion today. First of all, engagement was not a strategy. It was a happening. It was a so social, in both societies, concatenation of discrete decisions made by very many different actors. U.S.-China relations is really a society to society relationship. Of course, the government dimensions at the national level are very important, in some cases determinative. But engagement wasn't just about two national capitals. And in some important respects at the heyday of engagement, I think the centers in both countries, the national levels, in some sense lost a certain control over uh, the relationship. I mean, if I think about where I was when the engagement period began, I was in Ohio, a fairly conservative political state with at the time a conservative governor, his name was James Rhodes. But his point was he saw in China the solution to the economic and rust belt problems of Ohio. Now you can say that was right, wrong. I think in Ohio it actually worked out pretty well. But the point is his motivation wasn't some big strategy about democratization or for that matter, even anti-Soviet. It was about producing jobs for the people of Ohio. And if you look at many of the reasons for university to university relations, they had to do with research agendas of faculty. They had to do with hard paying tuition students. Uh, they had to do with who are gonna staff the language programs and who are gonna be the RAs in labs. So the point is to categorize engagement as a strategy, brand the people who promoted it as naive is to, is to miss what in fact motivated the effort from the ground up. So I think that's one very important thing. Secondly, the uh, critics of uh, engagement so-called basically uh, uh, say that uh, we made the wrong choices. But I think we would ask, this wasn't a central choice of a strategy as I've just said, but what it was, what you need to ask yourself is every way, uh, step along the way of the last 40 years, when would it really have been uh, reasonable in the American political context to go for a much more confrontational policy? Uh, would we have wanted to do that in the Asian financial crisis when we needed China's help to stabilize Asia, as indeed it played a major role? Would we want to do it in the midst of 9-11 when we were coping with the Middle East, Central Asia terrorism and didn't know what to expect in terms of our own domestic security? Would we really wanted to have had the divorce with China in the Afghan and Iraq wars? And those dragged on, as we all know, for 20 years. Would we have chosen to change our approach uh, in uh, the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. So the point is, this was a sequence of decisions arrived at in a context of a, of a globally involved US, a preoccupied US, and quite frankly, nobody was arguing for a confrontational pro, uh, decision earlier on with any, uh, what you might call seriousness, precisely because of the agenda of other issues we faced. So to sort of go back and say we were 20 or 30 years too late in recognizing China's capacities really is to ignore the history of the intervening uh, 30 years. Uh, and I would also ask along the way of this account, the implication is that China made all the mistakes or committed all the infractions. But I would just ask, did our embassy bombing in 99 of uh, the Yugoslav embassy play a role? Uh, did mismanagement of our own economy in 2008 and 9 play any role in this? Is our own declining governance capacity at the current time even playing a role? 
And whilst China's uh, sort of whitewashed pandemic response initially, does anyone seriously want to argue that we've advanced our own security with our pandemic response, at least until uh, the current administration? So I think the current narrative isn't balanced uh, in its assessment of how this relationship's gone off the rails. Uh, finally, I would just say, uh, uh, in terms of another major uh, thrust in, in the volume, is that the defi defining characteristic of our current period now, I think, is deterrence. But for much of the period, the defining characteristic was reassurance. So what has happened, you know, I think, in more recent times, really, maybe since beginning in 1995-96, we've gone to an increasingly deterrence-based relationship, which isn't based on reassurance, but rather threat. So there's been a fundamental change, and I would think the engagement policy in some sense uh, reflected that, uh, beginning in uh, Secretary Perry in 1995-96 in the Clinton administration. Now, let me just conclude with two points, because I'm not here to argue that everything uh, so-called engagers or the engagement period brought uh, were without uh, second guessing or uh, a, a sort of logical uh, difficulty. I think there was a miscalculation in one of the uh, chapters in the books by Barry Naughton, and it, uh, chapter seven, it talks about our inability really to imagine how rapidly China would grow economically and how that increasing capacity would converge with Chinese nationalism to set a whole new foreign policy problem. So I think there was a big, big problem that we just didn't anticipate this rate of growth of economic power and then all the attendant forms of power that economics provides. So I think that's that's true. All I can say is virtually nobody predicted this magnitude on such a sustained basis and then such a coupling, so to speak, with nationalism. The other, I would say, miscalculation, if you want to put it that way, or at least a blind spot, is I think many of us, and I'll just speak for myself, I'm not purporting to speak for the other authors or other persons, but I think that, um, we thought that some of the new norms in China were more institutionalized than they were. And in the same way that we probably thought the norms of American democracy were more institutionalized than they were as Trump showed them to be, certainly Xi Jinping came along and has re reversed or offset or weakened or diluted many of the norms that we thought were more firmly embedded. So I think this whole period invites the question of how important are leaders? And I think the answer to this is they are very important. So that ought to be enough, Chung Lee. I hope that uh, gets something going here. Thank you so much. Suzanne, over to you. Great. Thank you so much to Brookings, to you, Chung, and to all of my co-authors, especially my co-panelists, Robert and, and Mike. And it's it's such a great honor to be here with both of you today, with all of you, and also to have been able to work on this book and be in the company of all of these great scholars who worked on the various chapters. And um, you know, this is a kind of a, a presentation based on our book, but I really uh, commend the chapters of the book to anybody who's interested in the 180 degree kind of shift we've seen in US policy toward China. And I really just want to make two points today, and I don't want to talk too long. I, you know, some of the points that I want to make uh, were raised by Mike, and I'll just foot stomp those. But I, we really do want to talk to the audience and, and get to the questions. Um, I come at this from the government perspective. So Mike talked about uh, sort of the period of US China engagement being a happening, um, not so much a strategy. And I came pretty late. Uh, to the US-China relationship. Uh, as a career diplomat, I started my career speaking Russian and working on the former Soviet Union in the 90s. Um, and so I didn't start doing China until the late 90s. And that gives me a pretty different perspective, I imagine, on the period of engagement from 
many of the people who worked on the book, in fact, maybe everyone else who worked on the book. Um, so the first point I would make is that, you know, the no and Mike mentioned this, the notion that engagement was some kind of a favor that we bestowed on China, or that it was mainly aimed at changing China's political system. It just doesn't comport with the facts and the history of the times. And it doesn't comport with the way the US government does foreign policy, frankly speaking. Um, I mean, the US clearly saw constructive bilateral relations or engagement, which I refer to as the period of constructive bilateral relations um, as working in the US government's favor and US interests um, for various reasons over the course of this period. And I think the benefits were clear and observable as Mike um, noted. Um, and I might add that all during this period of at least the part I experienced of this constructive US-China relationship, you know, so it wasn't adversarial or hostile, that's true. Um, but there were constant periods of adversity um, driven usually by miscommunication, misperception, domestic political turmoil in some cases, um, exogenous crises, as Mike mentioned in other cases. Um, but my co-author of the chapter in the book that I worked on, which was 40 Years of US-China Diplomacy, um, who was Ken Lieberthal, um, you know, as we mentioned in our chapter, I mean, each time we went through one of these crises or periods of adversity and things looked uh, kind of dim for the period of US-China engagement, you know, leaders on both sides of the Pacific in China and in the United States saw the value of bringing things back to a constructive path. Um, of course, you know, in the early days, the US wanted a stronger China to balance what was viewed as the main threat to US interests, the Soviet Union. Um, there was no talk of sort of fundamental change, fundamentally changing the regime in Beijing um, when we made decisions to do things like sell arms to the Chinese in the 1980s or run guns to the Mujahideen uh, through China after the Soviet invasion. Um, almost no one anticipated the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And I, I think as Tom Finger points out in his chapter, and I was reminded since I was in the former Soviet Union in 1991, um, you know, throughout the 90s, nobody was particularly sure of the trajectory that the Soviet Union was going to be on. And that issue really did dominate US foreign policy and threat perce perceptions throughout the 90s. Um, you know, then China's economy began to grow, of course, and the issue of binding China into the international system more tightly became a big focus. Uh, but of course, there was also, as Catherine Tai pointed out today in her remarks at CSIS, um, there was the Chinese market with all of the allure that had always been characterizing uh, the huge Chinese consumer base and that market, and of course, also the fundamental problems there. Um, I think multiple authors in this book also show that the US assessed the substantial benefits to be had from these policies and took advantage of opportunities presented by contextual factors. Um, that factors mostly created either by China or by outside actors or events. So in other words, we love to talk about engagement as a masterful grand strategy, but in fact, um, there's very little evidence of, of that. It was more of a happening as Mike mentioned, and there's almost no evidence that, that even if there was a grand strategy that it was aimed at overthrowing China's political system. And I think there's been, to the contrary, an implicit acknowledgement in the US government, at least in the time I was there, um, that there was an implicit acknowledgement that the US has no innate ability to, to do something like that, that that's not within um, our, uh, the possibility of, of our control. So, um, so if we're not charging that the US failed at trying to change China's political system, 
I guess the question is sort of what is the charge then today against the engagement strategy? And I think um, it seems to be to me, I mean, Mike mentioned um, a couple of the blind spots, but the charge to me seems to be that China is now using its newfound power, you know, acquired with the assistance or at least the acquiescence of the US to challenge US military dominance, a dominance that has been the case in the Western Pacific since World War II. And um, this has given rise, as I think John Garber in the book points out, to a sense of kind of betrayal by China of US largesse and a kind of disappointment. Um, and I think it has to be said that we can't ignore the fact that this feeling of betrayal and disappointment happens to come at a point in uh, US history when we may be feeling slightly more vulnerable um, and more questioning of our future position in the world coming off as we are of two long running wars, which neither one of which can particularly be called successful, a financial crisis that had the possibility of bringing down the entire system. Um, and of course, then the 700,000 deaths that we've just threshold we've just crossed with this latest crisis and challenge that we face the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I think, you know, looking back at the history of what actually happened in the context can help us to make a more credible assessment of what engagement actually was, why the US government saw it in its interest to engage with China, what benefits the US actually reaped from that engagement over time. And I think my second main point, um, which Mike also raised, but which I think really needs to be emphasized here uh, and to be understood by Americans is that, and, and this is very richly detailed in the book, the kind of happenings of history and what happened in the relationship, the difficulties in the relationship are not all one-sided. I mean, it's not all caused the problems that we're facing by uh, wanton Chinese ambitions or guile or duplicity. Um, you know, there's certainly a plenty of responsibility on the Chinese side, but the severe mistrust that's built up and, and led to where we are today, I think can be laid at the feet of both governments fairly um, and are mostly a product, I think, of regional military competition. We talk about a lot about the economics, but really, in my view, the problems uh, can be sourced to the regional military competition, the domestic political drivers in both countries that highlight this competition, and the misperceptions and exaggerated responses and claims that come from that competition. And uh, some claim you know, that the implicit bargain in US-China relations was that the US agreed to refrain from undermining China's communist government and that China acquiesced in response um, acquiesced, sort of outsourced its defense or its security to the US security umbrella in the Pacific and agreed to sort of peacefully resolve disputes. Um, again, while this may have been the impression in certain American minds at the time, uh, there's really no evidence of Beijing's acknowledgement um, of such an agreement or arrangement or trade. And it would be remarkable if they would have agreed to that given the degree of suspicion in China of uh, Western and US intentions. So I think, you know, it's clear from the events recounted in the book that China was not considered a friend in either US political discourse or by US foreign policy elites at really any time during the so called era of engagement. Um, you know, lingering antipathy toward communism in the US and China's fraught human rights record you know, made China a punching bag in almost every US presidential campaign um, as, we, as we look at in the book. And this was even before China's, you know, determination to pursue military modernization um, as a result of the 95-96 Taiwan Straits crisis. So, um, you know, no matter what we say in the US domestic political context, China was always a negative issue. Um, but it's also clear 
you know, that the U.S. assessment that an isolated or an unstable China would, you know, the assessment that that's more problematic for U.S. interests than an engaged or a successful China, um, you know, that, that assessment managed to resurface time and time again. And I think um, we saw, you know, many presidents who had bashed China during their presidential campaigns run into the hard realities of dealing in foreign policy with US-China relations and, you know, changed their mind and moderated a bit. So I think, you know, um, this, this was the case really until 2017. Um, and many people have tried to explain why there was this sudden change in the US assessment of China. Mike mentioned a couple of the factors. Um, you know, I was there and I can only say that none of the explanations that I've heard to date about this 180 degree change uh, really makes sense to me from the perspective of long term US interests. And I submit that this will continue to pose big problems for US foreign policy in the decades ahead. So I hope we can get in the discussion section to uh, some, some thoughts about you know, where we might be going from here. And over to you, Robert. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, thanks to Brookings. It's very good to be with all of you today. And it was certainly an honor to be able to participate in putting this book together and to contribute a chapter. Uh, Mike and Susan have already said a lot about what they see as the problems with the current narrative that is critical of engagement. I'd like to add two other uh, critiques to that. One is implicit in all of the um, critiques or even attacks on engagement has been the idea that the advent of Xi Jinping, who has been more repressive at home and is more aggressive internationally and is taking China from authoritarianism to something like techno-totalitarianism, the critique is that the advent of Xi Jinping was somehow written in everything that preceded it, that we should have seen Xi Jinping coming under the leadership of Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. And I would argue that it, that it wasn't written and it wasn't perceived. China, in fact, changed tremendously during those decades. And while it never changed as quickly as we would have liked, it actually was moving toward more international integration and toward increasing freedoms within China. I wouldn't want to overstate this, but the trajectory prior to Xi Jinping or perhaps prior to 2010 was in keeping with claims that proponents of engagement made for it. You know, we always got less than we would like, and the Communist Party always got a little more than it bargained for. So I don't think that Xi Jinping was written in what came before. And the second, I think, premise of some of the critiques of engagement is that China has stopped changing that we now know where it's going and that everything is set. And I am certain that that is not true. The story of modern Chinese history is one of very rapid change and fantastic human adaptability. Uh, and I think that that is still ongoing. Those are, so those are two points I wanted to put right on the table at the beginning. Now, this era of engagement is now certainly over. And this is why Mike's chapter uh, calls, uh, pr pr provides a eulogy for engagement. We should also point out that we never called it the era of engagement when it was happening. That's an ex post facto name. At the time, we just called it US-China relations. And the Chinese didn't call it the era of engagement either. They called it reform and opening. And that's really the, the, the Chinese historical narrative into which this fits. So let's just look at reform and opening for a minute and about some of the instincts that constituted it. First, China's reform and opening was always self-interested. We knew that. Uh, it was to some degree nationalistic, if you like, but it was primarily self-interested. It was about improving the economic and technological uh, well-being of the Chinese people, about improving their health outcomes and educational outcomes, and yes, also about building China's power. So it was self-interested, but reform and opening was always, prior to Xi Jinping, self-critical. There was a broadly socialized understanding that China had fallen behind and had taken some wrong decisions and that needed to look at the rest of the world and study the rest of the world and adapt it to China's needs. There was a, a willingness in the reform and opening period to take certain risks. And then lastly, and both Mike and Susan have touched on this, there was something that was very celebratory 
about reform and openness. After a period of isolation and extreme violence and deprivation, uh, some of it imposed from without, much of it self-imposed, China, one-fifth of humanity, was now open to the world, and there was a perfectly natural, laudable human response on every side that was celebratory. So this is to say that reform and openness, as Mike said, was a whole of society uh, process. And that exposure to the rest of the world bred success in China. It bred, I think, justified pride in China's accomplishments. That led, in some cases, to a resurgence of Han nationalism, which we're seeing more of now, but that wasn't what all of the pride was about. Uh, and openness also inspired a rediscovery of Chinese traditions of humanism, as well as an interest in international humanism, the humanism of the Enlightenment. And that really changed China in ways we have to uh, continue to bear in mind. It wasn't just about China's material and technological improvement for the people of China. Many Chinese were interested in interconnectedness for its own sake. Chinese ideas about individuality, the importance of in the individual. They're very models of human flourishing come out of this period, changed ideas about things like sexuality and romance, openness to religion. These are all some of the fruits of engagement. Um, there was a rediscovery of the full scope of Chinese humanity during this period. And I think that that was the full meaning of reform and openness for most Chinese people. Now, of course, uh, this is not really Xi Jinping's agenda. We see him going in a different directions now uh, with a crackdown uh, that is commercial and cultural in the run up to an important meeting at the end of 2022. And he's cracking down on e-commerce, social media, uh, fintech companies, celebrity culture and fan clubs, uh, selectively cracking down on very wealthy and very successful Chinese. He's going after tutoring and educational companies, private schools, gaming companies, also companies that uh, deal in algorithms and collect a lot of data. Uh, he's banned cryptocurrencies, real estate companies, uh, male performers deemed to be effeminate, cosmetic surgery, English language education. The, the, this list goes on and on. Now, some of this is about a legitimate need for greater regulation in China. Uh, in China, as in the United States, uh, certain industries have developed faster than the regulators, the law could keep up with them. But that legitimate lead, need alone doesn't account, I think, for the suddenness and scope of Xi's crackdowns. Uh, and again, it's not just about corporations. It is, I think, a cultural rectification campaign that is going to be sustained because Xi Jinping has always been about control and you have to give him high marks for consistency. Why is this campaign cracking down on both the commercial and the cultural side? There's a common thread that's very important. And that is a finding that openness, while it served China's needs over the past 40 years, actually overshot the mark and that it now has to be reined in and reconsidered. Uh, for a range of reasons. And based on that, Xi Jinping is making a big bet. He is betting that the energy, the entrepreneurialism, and the innovation that have fueled China's rise can be sustained even with fewer economic incentives and even with restricted economic, social, and cultural freedom. So what's interesting about this, I want to circle back now to engagement. One of the things that's interesting about this is the kinds of resistance that Xi Jinping is meeting from the grassroots, from Chinese who have lived through this period of openness and reform and engagement and have been involved with the rest of the world and changed by the rest of the world in the ways that I described. So we see women pushing back against the patriarchy, saying in various ways that they don't like the way they're treated in the new era. We see this in the Chinese version of the Me Too movement with women speaking up against uh, sexual harassment and domestic violence. We see Chinese female rock stars and stand-up comedians mocking the patriarchy and mocking Chinese men and protesting the way that they are treated. And we see this too uh, in the concern uh, from Chinese women about the potential for new abortion laws, which Chinese women are comparing to The Handmaid's Tale, the Margaret Atwood book that is now made into a, a, a TV series. Notice that these forms of protest, Me Too movement, rock and roll, stand-up comedy, references to popular TV shows, all of these forms of protest are important. They're more or less Western or American, even though the content is specifically Chinese. The young are protesting. 
they're, they're pushing back against the, what they call the 996, what we would call the 24 seven rat race. Uh, and they don't want to you know, be, just become wage slaves in the service of national growth. The lie flat movement, the people who are just sort of dropping out, the new slackers of China, if you will, this is a form of grassroots protest. The young, despite the exhortations of the government uh, to be more fertile, are marrying and having children later. The older pushing back against calls to retire later. They want their pensions. Gig workers are pushing back against their treatment. And young internet users are pr protesting certain aspects of the surveillance state. So we're seeing this um, push back from, I would say, the international integration, integrationist humanist strand in China. I don't mean to suggest that these people constitute a political faction or that China is ripe for revolution. I don't think that's right. But we continue to see different impulses in China in tension. The nationalist impulse represented by Xi Jinping, the control impulse is in tension with the impulses of people who, while they're not actually calling for American style human rights, are asking their government to be more humane. And this suggests that there are aspects of modernity from which the Chinese people cannot be isolated, no matter how proud they are of China's achievements and how strongly they support Xi Jinping. And this humanist strain is one of the ongoing fruits of engagement. And I would argue is one of the reasons that we need to remain engaged because if we get our public diplomacy right, Many people who are influential in China are still reachable, especially if we put ourselves in dialogue with them rather than preaching to them. China is still changing. So the era of engagement is over, but the fruits of engagement are still present and we need to keep track of them. I'll stop there. Well, great. And uh, many thanks, um, Mike, Suzanne, and Bob for sharing your insights and perspectives, uh, which have been very comprehensive and thought provoking. Uh, we have already received uh, more than 50 questions by email, both in advance and also during the webinar in the past uh, uh, 40 some minutes. Now I would like to first raise one general question for all of you and then choose a few questions from the audience for each of you individually. My general question relates to what I see a contrast between Washington and local governments. Local governments include a state, city, and the country levels, also include the grassroots America regarding engage, uh, engaging or disengaging with China. Now in Washington, we have seen continuity rather than change from the Trump administration to the Biden administration in terms of uh, they are raised to be tougher on China. Also, it has been often said that the Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill disagree on everything except China. Now, but out of the build away, we may see a quite a different kind of bipartisanship. Local leaders, Republican Democrats in America want to savage the economic, educational and the cultural ties with China. In recent years, uh, state governments, I saw uh, um, a news that the, in the United States have set up 27 representative offices in China, state government, more than in any other country. According to one st US study released a couple of months ago, China is the largest import partner of 15 US states last year, 2020, including California, New York, Florida, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. They are, these are very important states, demographically and politically. Now within grassroots America, yes, there's a widespread criticism of Beijing's um, aggressive conduct in various uh, fronts, as Bob just uh, you know, mentioned in detail. But at the same time, American education institutions have been known for their strong continuing interest in receiving students from China and the collaborative research with Chinese scientists. And also you can go with also the medical profession, research profession, and et cetera. Now, my question for, for you is how should we reconcile 
this interesting contrast. Who would like to go first? Maybe Michael? I, I could start. Okay, um, Mike mentioned this, so maybe you want to start, Mike? Well, I, I will just flag a, a couple of things. One is I mentioned Governor Rhodes, I think was practically the first word out of my mouth, the governor of Ohio in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and he was a major force first bringing the Japanese investment to Ohio, but then subsequently the Chinese investment. And you Fu Yao Glass, I think accounts for two or th more thousand jobs just in Dayton, Ohio alone. So uh, the governor, governor level, the state level localities are really about economic development in both of our countries. And it's in, and importantly true in China as well. So when you engage the economic aspect of the re relationship, you, you uh, energize the local levels. And the local levels don't have a particular foreign policy responsible that we might, uh, responsibility called either strategic or or for that matter, they have their commitments to human rights, but that doesn't necessarily have to intrude on every agenda that a state or local leader may have. So I think that was the implication and I agree with the thesis in your question. I would just say one other thing that I think has a policy implication now, uh, and maybe as much for the Chinese uh, as any, uh, one of the things they did to uh, activate local government, and if you look at all the states between the Rocky Mountains and the, uh, the Appalachian Mountains, you'll notice a lot of states, each of which has relatively small populations for the most part, two senators, and they are importantly agriculture states. So China in retaliating against our tariffs, which I, I can understand, has retaliated on the farm sector and they are naturally China's biggest allies. So I think if I could suggest one thing to China is that is live up to the phase one trade deal and activate these local governments across the big swath of our, uh, of our economy and our society. Now, I don't want to imply it'll solve all problems and people only care about economics and not all these other issues. But the, the point is that local government is about economics importantly and education and students and all the things that come with that. And you'll notice how fast local government pushed back or and local universities and state universities when the visa restrictions got so tight on Chinese students that numbers were, were afraid that we're going to fall and with it tuition, you really energized local institutions. So I just would sign on to the implication of your thesis, Chung Li. I'm sorry, Susan. No, that's fine. I was just going to mention that I think that this question, Chung, gets at the heart of some of the uh, kind of misgivings or uh, disillusionment with the engagement era. And it kind of brings to light the differences between the US bottom up system and the Chinese top down system. And I think I agree with uh, what Mike said, you know, US local governments are mainly focused on microeconomic issues. So they're supporting companies. It, the same is true actually for Chinese local governments. But, you know, it, the narrative that has emerged from this is that uh, the US bottom up system doesn't inculcate enough um, knowledge, suspicion, whatever you want to call it, in on the part of local actors to be aware of how the Chinese top-down state system can coordinate and uh, somehow take advantage of an uneven playing field in these exchanges. Um, so I think, you know, many people would say that the way the U.S. system is structured um, makes it there's a high propensity for maybe local governments or even individual companies not to look out enough for US national security or national competitiveness, never mind human rights violations, as, as Mike rightly mentioned. Um, you know, I think this can be debated. I think um, there are ways to take care of some of these issues without becoming a top down system like China's. Um, I think some cases, probably the narratives in this vein are exaggerated. 
Um, and I think we should be debating these topics because the US, as we all know, is a proud open system and a proud market economy and a proud democracy. And we believe in that system and think it's the best one. And so we should be able to come up with remedies for some of these uh, discrepancies. But you know, the importance of China in the global economy can't be ignored or denied. And it's going to continue to, to be a factor in the thinking of, of not just local governments, but you know, bottom-up actors in the U.S. across the board, and, and we've got to realize that and not try to sweep it aside. Thank you. I could, uh, Suzanne, uh, Bob, do you want to have to say, say anything? Yeah, just a, a somewhat more pessimistic take on Susan's point, which I, which I agree with. During the engagement era, states and local governments, corporations, NGOs, universities, even parishes were all free to develop their own China policies. And that was a good thing. That was rich and diverse. But I think those days are over. Uh, in Washington, security dominates. And it's going to mean that subnational actors in government or in the private sector are going to be under increasing pressure to align with Washington's policies and will no longer be able to, if you will, freelance their own China policies. Because I think that we're in this uh, more difficult relationship for the long term. And that the, the sorts of the atmosphere, Chengli, that you described at the beginning, um, that's over. Uh, it's going to be the, the competition narrative, the security focus, I believe, that dominates going forward. I'm not prescribing that, but I'm predicting it. And I think that the scope for subnational China policies is going to be greatly restricted. Well, it's a very balanced uh, uh, based on the three panelists. I think you provide them. Um, some kind of hope to also talk about the continuing challenges. I think this is really well taken. Now, because of time that we need to move to the audience questions, and please be sure that you answer within one or two minutes, because otherwise we cannot finish. Uh, the first uh, from, uh, and also I wanted to emphasize on now and the future rather than the history when you answer these questions. And uh, first from Andrew uh, Furlan at uh, Medicare Asian Pacific, here's the question. Who says the US has to engage with China? It doesn't. It is not like uh, anything that the US gets from China. It cannot get from elsewhere with the possible exception, midterm of the real earth. Compete, yes. Engage, why? Maybe Mike, you answered the question because that, that view has some um, a, a representation in uh, some corners of this country. Otherwise, you cannot uh, explain why decoupling has such a, a huge market. And also, as Bob, uh, Bob said, uh, engagement is over. So please, Mike. Well, uh, to respond to Andrew, I, I would question uh, a number of examples, but let's just take the rare, rare earth. Uh, actually, China doesn't have a stranglehold on rare earths, and indeed, rare earths aren't even rare. The, the, the fact of the matter is rare earths are fairly widely distributed, but they're very costly to the environment to extract. So people have created some, let's say, interim dependency on China because they'd rather tear up the Chinese environment than their own. Uh, and so uh, we, we don't have a dependency there. And in fact, many Chinese people are resentful that their previous governments have allowed foreign firms to either dump garbage or toxic waste or mine rare earths. Uh, and uh, I, in some sense, they have their point of view, which I, I at least have some sympathy with. So uh, first of all, I think who's dependent on who and how many substitutes there are. You have to go case by case, but rare earths would be one of the worst examples I could think of. Now you asked on the other side, uh, what, what do we need that we can't get somewhere from Ch elsewhere than China? Well, I would say China's the biggest emitter of CO2 and any degree to which we can cooperate to reduce that is something that we can't get anywhere else. Because if China doesn't deal with this issue and we help in the ways we can and by doing our own in our own circumstance. So there are some of these global issues for which there is no substitution, uh, substitute for Chinese uh, cooperation. So. Uh, I guess I'm just rather out of sympathy with both points of the question. Thank you. It's a, the climate change. 
um, you know, carbon neutrality is a good example. Um, the next question is from uh, Queen uh, Marsh at the uh, Ancola Consulting Group. Uh, here's a question. What is the most realistic path toward for productive engagement in line with American interests? Now, Susan, um, your introductory remarks really have already touched on this, but also from historical pr perspective. Here, I would like you to explicitly tell us uh, what about the most realistic path. Yeah, I like to think of myself as a person who's very pragmatic and who operates, tries to operate on the plane of reality because that's the only way that you can really get things done and move things forward. And so, you know, and I try not to be too pessimistic because I have seen, um, as Mike alluded to, the agency of sort of personal leadership in my time in government and how that can really move issues and change things. Um, you know, as, as we noted, I, I mentioned in our chapter, you know, all US presidents come into office thinking they're gonna be tougher on China and then they run into reality and they adjust. Now, President Biden certainly doesn't want a crisis with China right now in the middle of all the domestic challenges that he's facing, um, but he appears to be unable to voice anything really constructive vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, given all of the domestic political constraints. And I would say that we saw that again this morning in the presentation by the US trade representative, Catherine Tai about the way forward on US-China trade, which was basically not to give us a way forward. Um, so, you know, the most Biden is able to communicate is that he hopes to avoid a conflict with China, because luckily everyone agrees that, you know, amidst the competition with China, we may, must make sure not to have a military conflict between these two nuclear powers. So that's good. Um, but saying that you want to avoid a conflict is a lot different from actually making it so. So I think, you know, my belief is that because of the complexity and the history and differences between us that in the absence of cooperation, and yes, you can call it engagement if you want to, it's going to be very difficult to avoid conflict. That is my sober assessment of the situation. So because I have such a dire and sober assessment of the situation, I therefore believe that the dialogue and some collaboration and some, yes, cooperation on mutual interests, including cooperation on avoiding conflict because it requires cooperation to actually avoid conflict, yeah. um, that that's gonna have to be reestablished over time. So you can say the era of engagement is over. I'm not sure exactly what that means, um, but some kind of engagement is gonna have to be continuing and maybe it'll be different um, we can hope that it'll keep the competition from slipping into overall hostility and conflict. Um, I personally think the most important carrot to give the Chinese in pursuing this avoidance of conflict is the prospect and a reason to be invested in maintaining okay. good relations with the United yeah. States. Okay. Good relations for their own sake has been a really important priority for China and um, I think discussions of other interests that are conducted inside a framework like that can go forward. But if okay. relations are hostile, I don't see how carrots or sticks are going to be effective. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Susan. The, the next question, maybe uh, the last question for Bob combines a few questions. Uh, as we are all keenly aware, anti-US sentiment has become alarmingly prevalent in China, as your uh, opening remark also reminded us. Uh, including among many uh, U.S. educated Chinese returnees, the so-called Haigui Sea Turtles. Uh, Chinese authorities' uh, promotion of nationalism and propaganda campaign are important factors. Do you think comments by American politicians on the so-called weaponization uh, of Chinese students in the U.S. by the Chinese Communist Party and also the FBI opening a new China-related um, counterintelligence case about every 10 hours, there's one case. Um, also, these are the also factored into escalating anti-American sentiment among Chinese young people. Now, related to this question, 
uh, is by Professor Dennis Simon at the Duke University. His question here is, I quote, the DOJ continues to pursue the China initiative, even though it continually fails to prove its cases about alleged Chinese spies. What is the real situation? Bob, two minutes. I think it would be very helpful if both Beijing and Washington toned down their rhetoric. Uh, there's a great problem with the way that this is framed and with the nature and the constancy of the accusations we fling at each other. It is true that the United States has the greatest higher education system in the world because we are open and international and that that creates some vulnerabilities. Uh, and it does open up possibilities for spying uh, and for IPR theft and for the loss of strategic information. However, to date, the demonstrable harm done to American security through the academy, that's a very thin list. And we have gained tremendously from our ability to attract Chinese talent. Ran Xiolin, uh, Ran, Ran Xiolin is a mechanical engineer at Purdue, naturalized American citizen who grew up in China. He just invented the world's whitest paint, which reflects 98% of ultraviolet rays back into space and reduces the need for air conditioning by 70 to 90%. This could be one of our greatest weapons against climate change. He's an American, he came from China. There are tens of thousands of Ran Xiolins in the United States and we must retain them even as we take reasonable steps to limit our vulnerability. Stop there. Well said, uh, Bob. Well, unfortunately, the time has come to bring this important discussion to a close. I would like to offer my deepest appreciation to our audience for participating in, the, uh, in this seven, uh, webinar and to our distinguished speakers, Mike, Susan, and Bob for sharing your wisdom and critical thinking. I'm particularly inspired by the sheer efforts to find a constructive way uh, forward. Now, please allow me to conclude with an insightful quote by another Brookings colleague of mine, Jeff Bader, who previously served as the senior director for Asia in the Obama White House National Security Council. He wrote in 2015, about um, um, now uh, six, six years ago, I quote, he said, East Asia has avoided major military conflicts since the 1970s after the United States fought three wars uh, in the preceding four decades originating in East Asia with a quarter of a million lost American lives. This is no small achievement. Let's hope this precious peace, as Suzanne also repeatedly said, uh, in the region will continue for the generation to come. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.